In the end, it was just an impulse that made her bolt. Like always, Lila supposed. Just past halfway into Lila's court-ordered 90 days, just a couple of weeks for Brenda. The actual escape was easy enough. They walked out the door after breakfast one morning as if they were going for a smoke. <clears throat> Lila knew there might be legal complications in the future, but the prospect of staying in bed until a decent hour and having a cup of real coffee made it compelling. Actually, a stronger stimulant would be even better. She could hardly believe that she'd gone this long. Brenda said she had an idea and called a cab on her cell. You know how these people walk out on their mortgages? Thousands of them. Their brand new dream home isn't worth what they paid, so they can't sell it without still owing money. They aren't idiots. They get out. No forwarding address. Lots of perfectly good houses sitting there abandoned. So the bank takes over, right? Eventually, you'd be surprised how long it takes them. This one woman I know has been in her place for two years now. You mean you just move in? How do you know which houses are available? I did this a few months before, said Brenda, and I've been working on doing it again. I knew this was coming. What I look for is green pools, really gross swimming pools, loaded with algae. Nobody cleaning them or putting in chemicals. Bad mosquitoes sometimes. West Nile, dengue fever. <clears throat> Pool, huh? Sounds like we're talking about a really nice neighborhood, Lila said. Oh, yeah, we're in the Valley of the Sun, girl. I found the place. Lila guessed that that's what they had to do. I don't have any better ideas. Brenda from the back seat directed the cabbie to a neighborhood west of Phoenix. She was cranky, complaining that she had a headache. Out here, Van Buren was far from the prostitution zone downtown, but still sleazy in an almost small-town way. There were large vacant lots between buildings and alfalfa fields and a grain elevator not far away. Pepe's Lounge Bar, ANC Tires, Tolson, the Opportunity City. We can stop drugs. Dave's Liquor, 99-cent store. Cristo Rey Pentecostal Church. They traveled through a zone of warehouses and business parks interspersed with walled housing developments that looked like they had been built yesterday. Turn in right there where it says Paradiso Estates. Lila realized that they weren't far from Perryville, the woman's prison that had become her great fear, her, nighttime, her nightmare destiny that she had so far evaded. Slow down, Brenda called from the back, where that for sale sign is. Which one, said the cabbie. They were on a cul-de-sac where there were three for sale signs. Eight, five, six, three, that's it. Pull in the driveway. This is ours now. It was the middle one, and its walls were only three feet away from its neighbors. The front yard was crushed pink granite with short and yellowing royal palm and a dark pencil-shaped cypress. Brenda had the house key. By the time Lila had paid the cabbie and walked in the door, she smelled meth, nasty but alluring. What I'd like to know is where you got that key, Lila said. I am so smart. She had a smile on her tight little face. Over the next few days, they moved in some used furniture, mattresses, a table, a couple of chairs. They talked about what they, could, they would say if the realtor or a cop came to the door. It was quiet so far from the city. They were surrounded by scattered new, new quickly built and quickly sold developments all hit by the wave of default and vacancy. Although the houses were relatively huge, the abandoned property reminded Lila of the reservation with its boarded up buildings and the old government compounds and the similar air of shame and defeat. Rather than succumb to despair, Lila exerted herself in netting out the clumps of algae on the surface of the pool. She didn't know how to empty and refill the pool or how much of the chemicals she found in the shed to add. My God, that's a lot of water. But money was running out and Brenda started disappearing for days at a time. The day Lila applied for a job at Walgreens was the day of the haboob. The store was in the little mall a short ride from the Buckeye Highway. 
She'd been in there a couple of times to get vodka, and now she noticed a help wanted sign on the door. She asked the cashier in cosmetics for the manager. The manager, too young to be a manager anywhere, seemed glad to see her. He somehow didn't fit his Walgreens shirt. The tail of it was almost untucked, ballooning out over his little paunch. His plastic badge said Chuck. The way he looked up, her up and down was kind of creepy, but at least he was smiling. Here's the application. You can take it home and complete it here. Better do it here. We really need to fill the opening. You've had experience as a cashier? Oh, yes, she said. She answered the questions on the application as best she could. Hardly a word was truthful, but she knew they didn't want the truth. Years out of the workforce, police record, including the warrants that were no doubt still out there. There was a separate aptitude test that Chuck cheerfully explained was to highlight your personal strengths, assuring her that there are no right or wrong answers. This included true or false questions like, it is sometimes okay to steal from your employer. <laughs> and it is impossible for a person to be on time every single day. No right or wrong answers? This, she supposed, was the way they screened out idiots. Wow, said Chuck, you made 100% on the aptitude test. I thought there wasn't a wrong or right answer. Well, actually, they tell us that 100% might mean you're a sociopath. <clears throat> but I don't think so. I think you're just a people person. He gave her another big smile. She smiled back as if to say, I am, I am. The only thing left was a drug test, which she could take on her first day of work if they decided to hire her, except for a few drinks at the end of the day and a little toke from her diminishing supply of crystal to get her going in the morning. She stayed clean and sober. She left the store thinking she would get the job and walked past two bus stops to a smoke shop to buy a kit called P-negative, <clears throat> which guaranteed to give you a passing drug test. She bought two of them. As she waited for the bus back home, the wind had started up and trash and dead palm fronds blew east at her feet. Over the low tops of buildings to the west, the distant sky was a dirty brown. The wind picked up and then abruptly reversed direction. People covered their faces with their shopping bags, shirts, or caps. At first, the wind only carried bursts of dirt, but soon the air became thicker and darker, and a teenage boy with jeans torn over both skinny knees pointed to the western sky. Jesus! A wall of dirt towered like a cliff into the sky, rising far above the tops of buildings and palm trees, scouring everything and coating it with dirt. The bus came, and they sc scurried into it, but the driver took it only a few hundred yards down the highway until he pulled into a bus stop and stayed there. Can't see a thing, folks. We have to wait it out. Don't suppose anybody wants to get off. The wind and dirt formed swirls on the windows, and the air was hard to breathe. There were only headlights in the dark. The kid knew what to call it. Haboob, he said, a blankness in his young gaze. His lips came together again with some sort of pleasure. Haboob. Toward the back of the bus, an old guy rasped through his few teeth. Goddamn Arab word. Is it so hard to say dust storm? <laughs>